All right, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here in person and I can't wait till I can take the mask off, but maybe for the benefit of all, I should leave the mask on. Um, uh, we're gonna have a really great session. I, I want Troy to introduce himself, although here he needs no introduction, I think. Um, really great session on minimum viable product, taking it from where we were last week, uh, which is from concept to, to, to test, to fleshing out the problem uh and uh, canvas to uh, okay now we got a great idea we flushed it out we've identified the problem uh and folks think it's something viable what do we do next on that um very easy answer right i, I, turn, oh, yeah. it, I turn it over to you gave me 90 uh, minutes <laughs> and Troy. yeah this is you know, a piece of cake right <laughs> um so here we go. Uh, I am, I'm going to let Trey again introduce himself, although here he needs no introduction, and I'm looking forward to, um, to the wisdom that's going to come out of this. Yeah, so thank you so much, John, for the opportunity. Um, for Sean here and guests online, I, I, was, I was somewhat between two minds on how to do this session. Um, I'm not necessarily a slides lecture kind of person. Uh, so I figured that that we, and I do have slides. If we want, if this all goes off the rails and no one's understanding, I can I can certainly pull up some slides. But I'd much rather have this as a natural discussion uh, to kind of walk through some some basic concepts that thread all of this together. But because of the uniqueness of this stage, and I'm really thankful that I get to do this because it really lends itself well to just having a discussion about the uniqueness of each individual innovation and company and adventure. Um, I figured that we, we would just kind of you know ask questions and, and, and talk about these, these concepts. But by way of introduction, uh, I'm an engineer by training. Um, I, I got a BSME for down the street at Drexel. Uh, I spent about 20 years uh, working for a variety of mid tech companies. J and J is probably one of the names you, that, that that is familiar uh, to most, and a number of companies that that no one has ever heard of. Um, I started to accumulate roles, titles, responsibilities uh, in sales and marketing and business development and operations and working in reimbursement and anyway. So I, I, commercialization has been in my blood for for you know, the entirety of my career. Spend about eight years consulting with early stage companies, helping them achieve commercial milestones. So this topic really is near and dear to my heart. And I'm passionate about seeing the transition from that idea into something more viable. Now, I understand in looking at the, the profile of all the participants here, we've got companies, we've got software, we've got service, we've got product, we've a variety of, of, of initiatives. And I want to make sure that we lay enough groundwork so that the conversation you know makes sense and resonates with everyone and, and gets as specific as we need to get and so make this lively you're online you know make sure you use the chat my chat box is up so if you have questions you know definitely use that i'll be popping some things in conceptually uh that we can start to review uh so that we can we can really make this something that's dynamic right and so you know, to kind of kick things off, there are a couple of things that, that allow me to bridge between the ideation that we talked about last week and where we're going to go next week, which is, you know, kind of the funding financing of it. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the, I think the, the acronym that, that sits in the description here, MVP, right? And so as we start to think about the minimal viable product, what, what comes from, what, what is that? All right, open question to, to, the, to the audience, what is, the minimal viable products. And trust me, I'm, I'm going to pick pick on people. So, so if I don't get an answer, Hi, this is De this is Deborah. Oh, 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 Deborah, you got you got the you got the comment. So I I would think is is your product or service what you're going to put to the market. Okay, good answer, Bruce. What do you have? It's uh, the product that you feel meets the need or pain point of the customer you're trying to to meet um, and just you know, minimally meets it without going into anything more than that. Correct. All right. So so that's, you know, Deborah, you, you had it. You had the essence of it, right? It is your product. It is your offer. But really, when you start to look at the MVP, it's what do you need from an offering perspective to get your point across, right? You've got to target customer. What do they need to make a decision whether or not this is going to satisfy their needs? Right, so you don't need to sell them the full-blown Tesla to describe an electric car. 
you need a vehicle that is powered by electricity at its bare minimum, right? To get people to understand is an, is an electric vehicle something that they want to buy into? Is that a problem that they want to solve? All right. And so let's, you know, we keep that in mind as we talk about the other main concepts in bridging this, this, this product launch, which is problem solution fit. And I'll type that in there. All right. The first concept is, is, is really that problem solution fit. If you're not addressing a, a, a true problem, no matter what your solution is, it's not going to gain resonance. All right. Does that make sense? So when we start to think about that, that, that solution that we all have, right? And so again, looking at the, at the variety of, of ideas that, that we share around this table, you know, what, what's, what problems are we actually solving? Sean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on you. So Sean's in the audience in, in the room here. So what, what, what is your solution? Uh, well, I've worked for a couple different companies. Um, so one company I've worked for, we have a electricity generated backpack. Um, so the specific need was from the military, they need electricity, and we have a backpack to make electricity. Okay, so what, what is what the, the problem when you start to, to, to really identify and concisely describe it? Uh, the problem was the military needs electricity out in the field. Excellent. All right. And so how do you validate that? What are the steps that you take to get make sure that that problem is significant enough where your solution may be warranted? Um, well, I mean, a lot of it came directly from the customer. They were very specific about what their needs were and what their minimum viable product was, like how much power they needed in the field for how long. Um, so that was very prescribed to us. You, you, so you have, you have the short, you know, the, 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 the easy path, right? So if someone told you specifically what they need yeah. and you're able to translate those needs, those user inputs into a design specification and create a product. Yeah, although I would say a lot of times what they think they need is not really what they need. And so that's a great point. So how do you how do you uncover that little nugget? Did everybody already said so? So not every not every customer knows exactly what it is they need, right? And so someone from the audience will say, Tony, what 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 do you do to uncover those unknown needs? Interesting question. Interesting. I'm, I'm, my wheels are turning about this question because, you know, I am unlike these greats in the room here, I sell brownies. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for me, finding those unmet needs were my through my focus groups through, you know, my sphere of influence, and really transitioning my brownie over to a plant, my original brownie over to a plant-based brownie. But for me, it was like my immediate sphere of influence. That's how I kind of, you know, ask those questions. And that's how I got where I am right now. I hope that answers your question. No, it's, it's, it's a great response because asking questions is really at the heart of it, right? And so you you went through a pivot. And I know that that um, I'm looking for, yeah, Ebony on there. Well, so Ebony is looking, looking at a pivot in her business, right? And so uncovering why, and where you do, where, where you go in that pivot really gets down to, as, as the, as the uh, statement in the, in the chat says, from Kiana, you ask questions. But can we talk about that question? Right? What questions are we actually asking? Right? And so, Tony, what questions did you ask to make that pivot from, uh, to, to, the, to the new running formulation? So, what I knew, because I was a former chef, what I knew is that there was no brownie mix on the shelf, right? People couldn't go into the supermarket like you can go into Nestle, uh, you know, buy the Nestle, you know, ready to bake stuff. That's what I knew. And I, and I asked the question, I was like, you know, I know you like brownies. Would you, would you prefer, you know, mixing your brownies or would you want something ready to pour? It was like, oh, ready to pour. We would love that. It makes it so convenient. And we still feel like we baked it. So that's what I asked. That's one of the questions that I asked. That, and that's, that's a great example of, and I'm going to be really critical on, on this one. It's, it's almost leading your customer, right? You have a solution of a ready to mix. And you're asking if ready to mix is what is it they want? So, you know, like, let's, let's you kind of reverse that thinking a little bit and really ask about the problem. 
or one of the ways that I like to, to approach customer discovery, which is what we're talking about now, is asking open-ended questions that really, really dig into their problem statement, right? So tell me about the last time you made brownies. Now, where, where do you think that answer takes you? So you know what? I, I apologize. I am a researcher by trade also. So <laughs> I did ask a lot of open-ended questions before I got to that question. <laughs> I'm sorry. But no, that is that is that is you're you're totally correct. This is this is for the win. Troy for the win, man. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but but does that ever see, you know, so so how we can how we ask the question is going to really dictate the responses we get. If we want to confirm that our solution is the best. Then we ask questions about our solution, right? If we want to understand the problems that we want to solve or that need to be solved, we ask questions about the problem. And, and in framing it, tell me about the last time you ate brownie. It could be, well, I had one, I had to go find that I didn't have any cocoa powder. So I had to run out to the store and get some cocoa powder, right? The eggs that I had were not sufficient. And so you start to hear the problems that people are facing, right? And then you know in the back of your mind, I've got a solution that can actually address all those problems. Right, and that's how you start to do that, that customer discovery, asking those questions as Keanu said before, but it really gets down to how those questions are asked. Who else wants to, to go into this problem solution uh, experience? How about Cassandra? Cassie, talk to me about your company. Um, I uh, have an ultrasound device that treats sinusitis and um, the problems that uh, patients have is that there are no, there's actually no FDA cleared uh, medications for, um, for sinusitis. So the treatments we have are not very ineffective. And when we talk to patients, you hear a lot of people talk about, I've tried everything and I've just ordered a Navage and I'm pouring water around my nose and I'm doing everything possible, but I'm still not getting better. And so we, we, hear, we hear a lot about the problem. Okay, so talk to, to share some of the questions that you're asking when you have your technology in mind as you start to look for that problem solution fit, that, that area of the world in your customer's mind where there's so much pain that they yep. need to be resolved and you are the answer. Sure. So, you know, the kind of questions is really just starting with, you know, well, what have you tried? What's been your experience? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Um, what are you going to do next if something else doesn't work? What are you frightened of? Um, and people, it, it all comes tumbling out, right? I don't want something that's invasive. I'm scared of surgery. Um, I have friends who had surgery and the surgery didn't really work that well. So, you know, looking for, you know, what that patient journey has been, what did they start with? What did they go to? And really mapping that patient journey and then understanding how uh, we can change that patient journey for them and where we would fit in that patient journey. Exactly. You, you mentioned there's a couple of buzzwords in there, but I think that they'll resonate. It's, it really is your consumer is on a pathway, right? Yeah. You are not the hero of your story, right? Your customer is. You are the shepherd. You are, and this is a, this is an analogy that I've used in the past, where Luke Skywalker in Star Wars is 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 the hero, right? And Darth Vader is the villain, and Obi Wan Kenobi is the guy. Right. And so you as a as a business owner are the guide helping your customer, the hero, live out their journey. Right. And if you really put your yourself in that sort of framework, you start to understand how it is that you are going to be interacting with your customers. And once you have that insight, getting to product launch, getting to scale, getting to all the other goals that the models that you have becomes that much more straightforward. Right. Whether that's brownies or the rotoscopes or stethoscopes or, or whatever the product is. You know, your consumer really has to be the hero and you're not gonna understand the hero's insights until you ask those questions. Questions, what, do, do, does, that, does that framework make sense? Right, Absolutely. Tian, you're, you're one of the first, Tian, you're one of the first to, to respond in the chat. Tell us about your company. Hi, um, my company is um, basically a software solution. I was impacted by COVID and I saw that communication in real time was not able to be sustained 
with the medical staff and families. So I'll create creating a solution that maintains communication in real time. Okay, so who is your primary customer? My primary customer is the medical system, hospitals, nursing homes. Those are broad buildings. Who within those buildings would you speak to first about their problems and their pain points? Because right, this is an important, this is a really important you know, point as well. When we start to talk about customers, if we start talking about buildings and structures, we start to lose sight of, of, of that, that laser-like focus. Right. right. So, oh. so even, even with brownies or, or, or a service, right? So there's got to be a person on the other end of that conversation, you know, that, that where we can have that interaction. So within the health systems, within the nursing homes, who are you speaking to specifically? Speaking to specifically would be the first responders, like the nurses and the attending physicians, um, because what we found in COVID is that, in my personal experience as well, whenever I needed an update, I had to track down a nurse, or I had to track down the doctor, or the doctor had to track me down on his schedule, but our schedules weren't always compatible. So we had a software that was um, synchronized and put everything together in real time it would help alleviate some of the stress that's, you know, given to the nurses who are already tapped out and overwhelmed and also help to alleviate the stress of the patients who have not been able to make contact with their family members. Excellent. So what questions are you starting to ask all of that customer base to really understand their pain points? Um, the customer, what I would ask is, what will you do the next time there is a lockdown or an expected shutdown or the pandemic um, makes another turn? How will you maintain communication, um, um, the time and the efficacy of maintaining communication with patients and their families? Have you asked that question yet? Um, I do ask that question. My grandmother was just hospitalized uh, two weeks ago. And we again found ourselves at the same um, impasse, um, just trying to synchronize schedules to communicate about her progress. And okay. they couldn't give me an answer because they didn't know. And that's Got where it. I come in. Gotcha. Now, and, and, and you see how that reveals where your solution becomes the pain resolution, right? Mm -hmm. So now there's validation, right? So it's not someone saying, well, I, I like you and therefore I like your product, right? Th those are not sustainable, that's not scalable. Right? That's going to get you a customer. That's not going to get you recurring customers. Right? But if you can really identify what that pain point is, and you've got a pain resolution, a pain reliever, right? you've got, you can, you're the alpha system to their indigestion, then, then you've got a home run. And that makes the rest of your journey, the rest of your pathway, that much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. right? so, so it really gets down to, again, in this problem-solution fit mode of, of the approach to product launch, really gets down to understanding where is the true pain, right? And do you resolve that pain? And if you don't, do you want to shift so that you do, or do you want to go and, and, and try a different, different pathway? All right. Ken, is Ken a, a, a participant? Ken, tell us about your company. Ken, we see you. Like I said, y'all, I'm, I'm not afraid to call people out. Ken's not cooperating. All right, Ebony, you knew it was coming. You caught me. <laughs> tell, tell us about your story. Um, so I have been, um, providing photo and video services for people's events, um, products occasionally, and what I call life moments. So baby showers, engagements, things like that. Um, I'm looking to transition now into providing those services via photo and video booths, including like 360 and like AR. <clears throat> now, what is, what is driving this, this pivot for you? Um, yes, it was interesting listening to, to, to everybody else go because like for me it was more about like my own burnout and um, having conversations with some other people I know who um, do similar work. So I'm a filmmaker first, first and foremost and I, I'm usually like, you know, in conversation with other filmmakers and you know, you just get the calls. People know you do, you know, they know you make films, they figure, you know, you can 
shoot a good, decent video or, 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 if, or, you know, take a decent photo. So um, that was sort of how I ended up starting, starting a business and just, you know, calls and referrals and just exhaustion from like, um, it was a conversation that I actually had with another filmmaker friend of mine in the last year. Um, because she was going through the same thing where it was just like exhaustion and burnout, like trying to do your own creative work and then getting calls from people constantly and just folks not being prepared, not having, not really knowing what they want. They just want you to come shoot a video like, uh, you know, like you just come in with a camera phone or something like that. I just want you to just do this. And it's like, what are you looking for exactly? And then like not understanding how long editing takes and all of these things. And so it was, um, she was going through something similar and I was like, it's, it was funny because she was like, you know, I think we just keep trying to give people art and they don't want art. They just want, you know, they just want videos. They just want photos. And so I said, that's interesting. So I started talking to a few people who I had worked with before and just was asking them the questions. And they were just like, yeah, girl, we just want good photos and videos. I don't care, you know, what it looks like or what it sounds like or whatever. I just want, you know, clean quality. And I'm like, well, I can do that in the booth with the booth, right? <laughs> I can do that with booths. And there were, uh, there were starting to be a lot of photo and video booths on top of like me being there doing photos and videos for a lot of events I was at, I know this last year. And so I'm just like, well, if that's the case, you know, that alleviates things for me and you're giving people what they want, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that was sort of, that, this, that's been my sort of journey and transition and reason. Um, yeah. Okay, good, good story. So, so, as you start to think about this, this journey towards product launch and this minimum viable product, where, where do you see yourself relative to that particular concept? Is, is, this, is this a burning question for you right now? Is it something that you have already, already you know, accomplished? Is it something that you see in the, in the near future? Where, where, where do you see yourself with respect to that question? With, the, with regard to like the pivot or? With respect, you know, with respect to you know, a, a relaunch, is, is oh, a relaunch. it imminent so that you need to understand how to really execute that? Or, or, yeah. Or, yep. yeah, I'm, 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 yeah I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, engaging with clients that I already have about like, you know, what, what that'll look like for them and, you know, what they're interested in and, and doing my research and, um, you know, pricing the booths and everything like that and, you know, hoping to, to make that transition and that relaunch soon. Okay. So so how does this discussion help you frame your your approach to understanding your next moves? Um I think yeah definitely um just uh being clear on you know what people are looking for um so that I'm not doing too much but also providing what people are looking for and then um I think just trying to make sense of like um to your point like what is sort of like you know the minimum amount of whatever i'm going to need to like just make it happen you know because like for me i'm like always a person that like i'll get in my own head too much about like okay i need this is a, a big to do you know like i kind of look at like all of these types of things like a, a film almost and then you know there, it becomes this mammoth task versus just like this is you know these are the events or, or things that are coming up with people I know with referrals or past clients this is you know how long it'll be this is what the pricing is and then you know providing a service so can I yeah. ask Go ahead. Ebony so for photo shoots people usually give look hooks right and then for film people usually create storyboards so you usually mm -hmm. give the filmmaker and the director right yeah. If you could think of lookbooks and or storyboards that you've done in the past where you actually know how many hours you put in to do them, what it took to do them, like and they perfectly explained like the look and the feel that the person was going for. Mm -hmm. If you got a few of them in, in and had several versions of them, um, would you be able to create questions based off of that? To be when you speak to someone, you'll be able to fit them like, okay, you're looking for this type of lookbook, and I know I could charge you this and provide these services. If that makes sense, I would assume maybe doing that may help you streamline the people that you work with to know that if they're a fit, so you can get paid properly, but also help you provide the right questions to figure out what exactly they're looking for. 
Yeah, I, I um, I've been um, looking at a few different things. I've been looking at like in the region, um, what people typically do um, in, in the like photo video booth sort of space. And mm -hmm. they usually do have templates and layouts for like, you know, either we can customize to, you know, to fit your event theme or, you know, these are the templates, these are the packaging because it's different. You know, if it's like a mirror photo booth, then you know, that might only be $500 for three hours, you know, where you print out the photos right at the event. If it's like 360, that's usually 100 upward. Um, and that's, you know, giving people the ability to um, at the event, you know, engage with the videos there, but also, you know, put them right online. Um, and so I've been looking at like other people's pricing and packages and what they've been offering in the region as far as like templates and things like that to, to uh, make up my own. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah, because copy paste, I'm always about copy paste, <laughs> you know, um, but in, in regards to like, uh, again, to the point of this theme and what Troy is talking about, I don't know, when I think of, you know, your work, um, it's a very emotional thing. And I think it falls under the line of like entertainment and, and delivery. So mm -hmm. I feel like if you can um, hone in on what type of emotions people are looking for to help uh, serve what type of product you can deliver to them and match that to that. Um, I think it, I think that could be helpful. I think that could provide a, a cool way to talk to people and provide an interesting fit, line up their emotion to the product. In motion being like, are you looking for extreme excitement and like you want like a bad, bad boy type of situation up in here or mm -hmm. you just for something simple? Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Bruce. Yes. Tell us about your company. Uh, I'm developing scientific tools for hobbyists, amateur scientists. Um, so there are lots of people who want to do science, you know, experiment on their own. People, students, schools, um, and, and also the schools, but also you know, hobbyists who are, you know, adults. Uh, but the tools are very expensive and uh, not very accessible. And so I'm uh, developing uh, much more affordable tools so people can explore and experiment on their own with their uh, and have that option open to them. Excellent. Where, where are you in, in your development pathway? Is it, are you launching? Or are you still ideating? With, and I hate that word, by the way. But I'm not withstanding. <laughs> I'm between ideating and launching. Okay, I'm assembling something now, but I'm also out talking to, I'm working on talking to potential customers, but right now my main, aim, my, the, my main target to talk to people are teachers. Gotcha. Um, so, so I want to get um, getting beyond teachers to you know like uh, high school kids and, and stuff like that is I'm still working on how to do that. <laughs> gotcha. So so you have you're kind of in this world of I've I've got an MVP maybe I've got an idea for what this should look like I've got you know what where what is that? Uh, so I have an idea what it should look like and actually I'm uh, I'm getting to the point of assembly. Got gotcha. it. All right. So. Bruce, yeah, is on the, parts. Bruce is on the spot. Nicole, what questions should Bruce be asking of his target audience? You called on Nicole? Nicole, yes. Nicole Clayton Morgan. So uh, if he's uh, trying to stir up, uh, you're doing st STEM experiments right you're trying to stir up a stem audience uh yeah that's the that yes <laughs> um a, yeah independent minded stem audiences the people who want to uh self-starting stem people mm. so what would be what would be an example of a question that he should be asking um do they even are they even familiar with with stem or with with what he's trying to do are they even familiar with with science that's a place can to start they, sure can they define what he's trying to do 
That's just that, that that's a good place to start. So now we're assuming that we're talking to to educators of we'll say we'll find it down to middle school students, right? A middle school science teacher is is sitting across from Bruce, and and what is another reasonable question to ask? Tell me about your current STEM program. That's a good one. What are specific interests? What do they want to learn? What do the students enjoy learning? These are all great questions, right, coming in from the chat about, you know, that, that are part of that customer discovery, right? Because again, Bruce has an idea of what he wants this to be. And guess whose problem that solves? Right? It solves Bruce's problem, right? It addresses Bruce's needs and his ideas, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone is going to pay for it. Right, because at the end of the day, you need to separate someone from their money in order to make money of your own. Right, that's 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 the end of it. Right, you know, not to be too crass, but that's that's the reason why you're in business. You know, fundamentally, to get someone to pay you for something. And if you don't know what that something is, or if you believe it's one thing and they think it's another, then that transaction is never going to happen. All right, and so Bruce talking to that that middle school teacher said, "Tell me about the last time that you were engaged in teaching science to your class. Tell me about that experience." And guess what? That's going to elicit a lot of oh, you wouldn't believe. I was sitting down with Johnny, and he didn't get it, and I have this. And so you're going to get them just flooding you with with their problems, and within that problem set are the answers that you're looking for. That's the information you want because that is then supporting what it is that you're bringing to them as a solution, mm -hmm. right? And again, this is transferable no matter what your business. Now, again, that reading through the demographics, there are service businesses here, there are software plays here, there are hardware plays here, and it really matters none whether what, what, you, what category you fall into, every one of you is gonna have a customer. Right. And again, if your if your solution doesn't match their problem, you're not going to get a transaction. You're not going to get that sale. You're not going to launch. Is that is that is that, is that coming across? Do we all see how it's universal? Because right? I think that's that's really what I want to get across. If there's a universality to that concept of a really identifying problem solution fit. All right. Because the next part of it is really where the money comes in. It's the product market fit, All right? So that goes into the chat. And I'm putting these, these in the chat myself so that there, there are tons. You, you, you put this into a search bar and you can find tons of research and, and references and resources about these concepts, right? So my job here is not necessarily, the way, the way that I'm interpreting my job is not to give you specific answers, but it's to give you directions where you can go and do your discovery, knowing that you've got John here as a resource, you have me as a resource, you have the entirety of the Science Center and this program as a resource to help you individually, right? But collectively, because there's such a diversity of business and solutions that we wanna make sure that you have a foundation from which you can then go off and, and solve these problems. Right, because we just addressed the problem solution fit. Now we can move to the product market fit. Again, this is where money happens. All right, and so product market fit means that now you've got an idea that someone is actually going to pay you for. Right, they're going to give you their money for whatever it is you've got. And so this is one of those things that you really need to focus on as well. But how do you get to that product market fit? Anyone have an answer? Bingo! Not trial and error. <laughs> but thank you for playing. Asking questions, more customer discovery, right? Asking questions again. It's about that problem, right? Because but now you've got a product. I've got a tasty candy here. John, do you like candy? Uh, I don't no. want this to get weird, all right? <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll do it this way. John. That's a self obvious question. <laughs> John, do you communicate with people? Uh, I try to. Yeah? How, how do you communicate with people? Uh, with the cell phone. Cell phone? No kidding. The last time you're using a cell phone, what happened? Uh, dropped the call. Ah. 
So now, if I understand now that that coverage is the problem, if I go into them and say, hey, guess what? I've got a film that has capacity for pictures and a camera that just is killer. That's not going to resonate, right? His problem isn't that feature, it's coverage. So I've got to go out and with, okay, try Verizon, try to, but it's understanding how to ask those questions so that you really get to the market you're going after. John's not gonna buy my phone because it has all the features. John's gonna buy my plan because it is not gonna allow him to drop calls, right? And so again, this, this is how we do it. And again, the questions that you ask and how you ask them are gonna help you understand how to get that product market fit, all right? Ken, I'm gonna try Ken again, Ken? Hey, I'm, I'm here, can you hear me? Awesome, we can hear you now. So Ken, I tell us about your business. Uh, technical issues so sorry about that no 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 worries you're with us now that's all that matters tell us about your business yes so um my business is called abstract sounds i am redesigning overhead headphones um in order to help people that want to stand out to do so uh we're utilizing additive manufacturing to redesign the headband of the headphones to take shapes of like DNA strands and things of that nature. Um, you know, to, to just help people kind of stand out in, um, in the crowd. Okay. All right. So who is your primary customer? It's going to be people who just have an innate need to be different, you know, kind of uh, stand out just people who have like green hair, you know, just because everybody else has brown hair or, or who dress a certain way so that they don't look like everyone else. It's um, really kind of like it, people who have a strong sense of like individuality. That's who I believe are, will be my customer. Okay. And where, where are you in, in your development stage of your company? Are you prototyping? Are you beyond prototyping? Are you, do you have revenues? Are you still um, figuring out so, the business model? Yeah, so I have so I have a functioning prototype. I, I have a working prototype and um I'm trying to get close to um kind of modeling what a pre-sale, a small pre-sale would look like for me. Okay, it sounds like you, you've got a highly customized business, right? You know, you're you're not producing over your headphones in mass. You are you are designing them to a a user specific input, right? And so, if I wanted a DNA helix, you know, you you're, you're not necessarily producing a hundred thousand of those. You're producing a couple dozen, right? That's that's correct. Okay. So, how do you how do you understand? How do you approach finding that product market fit, or how are you doing that? So, so one thing that I did. Um, a few months ago is um, I kind of threw almost like a like a, a, a party, if you will, um, where I had some of my models available for people to kind of test, try and um, and uh, give me feedback. Um, so that, that's one thing I did. Um, uh, utilizing social media, just putting up renders and um, putting up pictures of my um, uh, some of my designs just to get people's feedback. That's that's what I've been doing currently. Um, yeah, that that's 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 what I've been doing. Okay, and so now it's a matter of figuring out how to how to convert those trials into an actual recurring customer. Yes. Right. Correct. And so again, it's 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 asking more questions. It is understanding you know more specifically who that target market is. All right, with a consumer item like this, it, it could be really, really niche, right? You can see it's, it's highly competitive and, and, and your target market may be a couple of thousand people with green hair. Right? <laughs> of, that, of that green hair population, maybe only a couple of thousand really want your, so it's, it's digging into that level of detail so that you understand who is going to buy your product because at the end of the day, Again, whether whether you are a filmmaker, photographer, whether you are a chef, whether you are a scientist, whether you are uh, a surgeon, whether you are whatever your whatever it is that you are offering, 
you want someone to pay you for that. Yeah. Right? Do, and that's, um, and, and, go ahead. Can I just can I ask one question along those lines? You can ask as many questions as you like. We have until so, six o'clock. So, <laughs> so my question is, if I if if a company has an MVP, right, and, and it's, it's literally just like minimally viable, do you sell the MVP or do you, I'll say, wait until you have a more polished product? Do you, the question is, do you sell your MVP, right? My, my simple answer is, if someone's going to buy something for you, you shouldn't turn the sale down. But that, man, man, that that's that that's just me, you know. It, but what what is it? What is your goal in in demonstrating the MVP? It's it's to help you understand what people actually need and what they're going to pay for, right? Again, going back to the electric vehicle, you you don't need to put in the nav system and all the you know computer software into an electric. What you're trying to ask is, do you believe, do you buy into the concept of an electric vehicle, right? And allow them to test that out, right? Do you buy into the concept of these customized uh, over, over ear headphones, right? And so if they do, then you can talk about all the other features that, that can go into it once you understand what they need. But, you know, short answer to your question is, is do you sell your MVP? If you can sell it, go for it. You know, more often than not, you're not going to be able to sell it, but if you can, take the money and run and go produce another, another prototype. Right? But really what that MVP does for you is it allows you to answer the questions that you have in your mind about the viability of your business. Right? If no one, no one is buying into the, the electric vehicle market and you've got this MVP, and knows that, then you know you've got to pivot. You, you've got to do something different. Right? You're not going to be able to sell that. You know, the, the, the classic, you know, counter argument to that is Steve Jobs with the iPhone, right? You listen to, you listen to him and, and a lot of his talk, you know, it's like, you know, consumers don't know what they need. I need to tell them what they need, right? And that's why we have these, these juicy, you know, smartphones, right? Because no one, no one knew that they needed a computer in their pocket. They didn't create a computer in their pocket, right? They didn't need to have their entire, you know, album, their CD collection, in their pocket, he created that need. And so there are exceptions to the rule and they really are exceptions, right? True uh, business principles, you know, say, go find out where the problems are and then identify the solutions and make sure that those two are married up. But you know, even with that, mm -hmm. by the way, I love it. I love it. I, I've been uncharacteristically silent for a <laughs> long time. Right? And that's because it's been really good. But even with that, right, it wasn't, that much of a leap, right? right? There were mechanisms that had music on a, on a there were mechanisms that had digital photography. What the iPhone did is, is put it all in one thing, which was, was was a leap, but it wasn't that much of a leap. Right. It was tested out, you know. Right. With that. right. There, there, there was proof of concept that existed, right? And so that was the genius of, of Steve Jobs, is he understood how to connect dots where, where other people couldn't. Right, I didn't see those dots to connect, and he was able to put them all together because he was, he was such a design um, um, a guru. Right, and so again, you know, there, they, there are some exceptions to the rule, but they truly are, are exceptions. All right, we're going to pick on someone else, Chris. Chris T. I'm here. Yes, yes. Tell us about your business. My business is a content education business. It's a platform where we put on, you know, advanced scientific knowledge. The customer is high school biology teachers. The buyer is probably someone from administration who makes those purchase decisions. And the audience is high school biology students. Pays to be later on in the program because you know, you know how to present the information in a way that won't, won't elicit new questions, right? And so, you know, Points to you for doing that. Okay, so where are you in this stage between creating the idea and scaling your business? Yeah, so this journey has been about eight months long now. I tested my MVP, which was basically me doing live lectures to students from anywhere in the world. I did that on a monthly basis so that I could make each monthly lecture the month before. And so I was able to stay really flexible without making something big up front. I sold that MVP to those students, got about 200 students from all around the world. 
that MVP went to develop my alpha product, which is a recorded version of those lectures that is totally automated that students can <clears throat> jump in on, take, get their certificate of achievement, share that to social media. Now I'm in the beta phase of my project, which is some version of that that also includes projects as well as like a matchmaking system to, for students to meet scientists. And now my target audience has shifted to high schools for high school programs. That's good. So, so you threw out a bunch of different Greek letters that that are germane to your development process. Do you want to kind of walk through what those actually mean when you talk about you know your your alpha and your beta? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, for me, I'm also a researcher, so um, for me, it was just about testing the smallest version of my hypothesis. The beginning was: Does anybody at all want to learn about the science that I know about? I validated that in my MVP because I got up hundreds of students that gave me money to learn about what I knew. Then from there, the alpha is basically the, the same thing as my MVP, but I added an additional layer, which was the automation on a platform that I spent more money on now that I had validated knowing that people wanted to buy it. So then that alpha version was uh, the automated version basically of my MVP. And then now my beta version is very similar, but now I'm adding on more trinkets. So the content, but in addition to the project modules, as well as the like meet and greet a scientist, which were not part of the alpha or the MVP. And since it's a little bit bigger, I've also changed who my customer is instead of it being an individual student anywhere in the world. Now it's a teacher um, where they can, you know, hopefully the school can, you know, uh, give me more money for a larger program. That was kind of my uh, uh, thought process. And I guess we can call it anything. It doesn't have to be alpha beta. It could be mark one, mark two, version one, version two. Right. No, and, and, and that's alpha because, you know, in, in some schools of thought, the alpha and the beta, alpha is an internal uh, assessment and beta is an external assessment. Oh, okay. Right? Uh, but, but you know, alpha, beta, whatever you want to call it. So, so the, 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 the moral of the story, the point of the, the punchline of the joke really is that you went from an, an initial prototype that had just the bare minimum to get feedback, right? And mm -hmm. Ken, this answers your question. Can you, should you sell your MVP? Well, Chris said yes, right? Um, and so after that, once you get feedback, then you can start to iterate based on that feedback. You can mm -hmm. start to build out more of those features that you have in your mind are gonna be important, right? And see if those, those iterations and those developments are gonna be helpful, right? And useful and solve more problems. But it, again, it's always collecting that feedback. I mean, that's what we want to make sure everyone's getting is that this is a market driven function and process. The market tells you how much you're going to cost, how much it should cost. The market's going to tell you how successful it's going to be. These answers can't be coming, can, cannot come from inside. They have to be market driven. And, and back to Ken's question and, and Chris's actualization. If, if somebody doesn't, might, if somebody doesn't vote with dollars, it doesn't have to be full price, doesn't it? But if they don't vote with that, you don't know whether there's valid or not, right? Correct. A lot of folks, if you go to friends and family or whatever, or even people that you know, it, they're going to feedback certain things that just make you feel good, mm -hmm. right? Um, the dollars are votes in this case. They don't necessarily have to be retail dollars and have to fall on the, uh, you know, on the business model and financial side, right? But they do validate the votes, right? Correct. Absolutely. It, it is. I mean, there, there's a book. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to find it and, and send it up. But it, it was it was you know the mom test. Right, and everyone's heard the mom test. But basically, if you go and you know talk to your mom and say, "Mom, do you think this is a great idea?" What's mom going to say? Yeah, <laughs> it's the greatest idea ever, and, and that's not necessarily the validation that you're looking for. You, you need to test it with real customers who are again going to separate themselves from their value money to support your business, your venture. Right, and so I, that's yeah, where, just, where you really go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say if I can just add one thing. One thing that really helped me in the beginning. Cause you know, you know, it's a great lesson to go out there and talk to people. But what I found really challenging, like what last summer, last fall was how do I even find these people to talk to? I don't have to be talking to them, but where are they? How do I reach out to them? And so the thing that really helped me was when I got my social medias going, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden I had a community of people that I knew would give me zero, just their attention to learn, learn about this topic. And then from there, I kind of pulled the people who are already in my social media communities, asked them uh, what I should do and even developing my MVP, and then asked them, you know, like iterations of basically the, the product as it's developed. 
But social media has been absolutely pivotal for me and my business to find the people, both the students and the educators. And so it was a worthwhile investment. I invested about six months to developing an Instagram community of about 10,000. TikTok, it's been about uh, two weeks for, an in, for a community there of about 15,000. And now I'm definitely reaping the rewards of actually investing my time for social media, which I'd never done before. So I would recommend that to anybody else about community generation. Breaking new ground. All right, so, so Deborah, why don't you come off mute and ask your question? So I was just wondering if you had a useful um, template or a plan when you're developing um, your MVP, because I have a service business. Um, and so the target market is sensitive um because i what i'm doing or i'm attempting to do is open up a grief center a resource center for children and young adults so the target market is actually the parents because they need a resource for dealing with the emotional issues around grief and so i'm trying to figure out what type of sensitive questions but important questions to ask without triggering a reaction as far as that might something that they, they don't know how to handle. So, so the short answer to your question is no, uh, there is no template uh, for it. It really is organic and it's unique to each business. Uh, but we can certainly work through some of the questions you might be able to ask, you know, in defining the value that um, that, that you start to present. All right? okay. so, so I'll crowdsource this a little bit. So why don't we go to Rick? You've been on for a little bit and kind of quiet. What 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 kind of questions should Deborah be asking uh, to really understand what what that MVP might look like? Uh, great dialogue, by the way. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I Deborah, the I love the community, if you will, or the solution or problem you're challenged with. <laughs> As a grandfather and parent, I, I I've seen challenges in in the youth, obviously through. Um, the emotional uh, traumas that are uh, across the board, be it mental health or family or wherever the problem's coming from, and the sensitive nature of uh, communication, if you will. Um, there's a lot of legalities, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, that kind of get in the way. Um, so I don't know if that's any input to help, and, and you may already be aware of a lot of those things. Um, but I like your direction in thought process and how to um, help those youth at some point, in, whether your product or solution um, may lead to um, a product or a service in the way of a community service. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so, I don't know. I thought I was on mute. Sorry. So, so um, to answer your question, yes, I am targeting... Um, uh, counselors at school, I'm targeting parents, and I'm also targeting um, the departments of incarcerated ch parents or children with incarcerated parents, because a lot of times when they're suffering from the emotional or loss of their parent, they, they act out in school and it's, it's um, looked at as a behavior issue instead of a grief issue. So I'm uh, targeting those type of resources and um, building up an online presence we, where to make it either peer-to-peer -peer mediation or youth groups at church or um, just so we can do now we're doing face-to-face -face communications but I want to target it down so that I can get more individuals of um, large influence to buy in and help with the programming. So Deborah, can I jump in really quickly? Yes. Um, I, it, so Evie, like she just literally was in my mind. I said therapist. The reason why I said therapist and social workers in my mind is because, first of all, think about it. Those are the front end. Those are the people who are actually dealing with it, and especially the what you're looking for, the terminology and the phrasing of it, so they aren't triggered. It's going to be a licensed therapist you need to speak to. And there's there's a huge communities of licensed therapists that are on Facebook, even LinkedIn. So hopefully you can use that as a resource. But there's more in the chat if you're looking, because everybody's we're we're giving you some energy, man. Yeah, I see. I see. I appreciate it all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we're building each other up. So so Deborah, I would start with. And, and this goes for everybody, right? Start with, tell me about, 
right? Whatever your question is, start with tell me about. Right? Tell me the tell me about the last time you had an interaction, a, a negative interaction with one of your students, one of your clients, and okay. let them tell you your their story. And in that story, you will start to peel away the elements that where they need the most help. And if okay. you can start to define those elements where they need the most help, that's where your MVP starts, right? That's where you start to coalesce around your service and how you can be of help. Because if you went back to them and said, guess what? This is what I'm offering. You'll, you'll see the immediate resonance because you're addressing, you're answering their questions, right? And so again, you know, tell me about is, is probably one of the most powerful three words, you know, right? three words, you know, to start a question with. Thank you. Um, yeah, because I started with, um, I created, I, I did it backwards. I created two brief counseling books um, first and then started th thinking bigger, like maybe I should just, you know, do a whole program instead of a series of brief counseling books. That, 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 may, that may be the ultimate answer, but, but again, don't project what you believe onto your customers. Help them, help, have them tell you where they need you. Right, that's going to lead to to you know shortcutting the process of of trial and error. Yes, thank you. <laughs> no worries. But uh, real quick though, um, how are you supposed to find the MVP when you offer a service not a product? So, so again, you know, the MVP, the minimal viable product, is is a term that is broadly used with you typically within software, right? And so, right. applications where you have just the first thing that comes out and you start to continue to go. But you can apply the concept universally, right? And so, you know, the one that I've been using has been the electric vehicle. Right. Again, a car has a ton of features. Right. The one that you're interested in is an, is an EV producer. Do you want to put an EV? Right. You already know about you know the the MP3. You know about the the NAS systems. You know about all the other features that a car has. I'm not testing that. Do you want an EV? And what does that mean? That means that there is you need to find a station where you can plug in. Right. If I give you something that only plugs in. Then you can you can see whether or not that additional step is something that you are willing to to entertain, right? And so that's a hardware that has a minimal viable product. It really is just enough to get someone to be able to provide feedback, right? Whether it's a service, whether it's a software, whether it's a hardware, you can start to understand what that is because she could have a ton of other services that she has in her mind. She probably does have a lot of services that are in her mind that may not be where her customers need her. Right, so understand the bare minimum so that they can say, you know what, this works, this doesn't work. Great question. I asked Deborah a question because, uh, uh, by all means, Deborah, when, when you mentioned uh, children of incarcerated uh, individuals, it, it triggered a thought. Uh, are you familiar with youth aid panels? Yes, I'm actually a mentor for the youth aid panel. Ah, okay. Uh, I, I would think that for those who are not familiar with youth aid panels, and I actually sat on one of the very first youth aid panels probably, oh God, 40 years ago uh, in Bucks County, but they are meant for first time juvenile offenders. And rather than going through the court system, they come in front of this youth aid panel. And as long as they do what the youth aid panel says that they should do, they'll never go into a court of law for what they did wrong. Is that a fair assessment, Deborah? I mean, again, my, my information is 40 years dated at this point. That is correct. As a, as a, a mentor to the UK, uh, it's a bunch of community leaders like um, and, and just concerned citizens who kind of take the kid um, or the, the offender by the hand and, and, and make them pay, not really pay restitution, but understand the actions that they committed and how it that one decision could change their whole life forever so we kind of go back and talk to these children about what would you have done differently if it was a, a fight or they just kept getting suspended or you know a lot of my cases are kids getting caught drinking in the cemetery you know that's who i normally get <laughs> but it is it is a great program and it's a um a great way to kind of curve the behavior of the children um, but the, when I say incarcerated ch parents, I'm talking about the, a child who may have a mother in jail um, or a father in jail, and then the, the mother is still in jail trying to parent. So the kids are rejecting the mom because you're in jail trying to make me make good decisions, but you didn't make a good decision to land you there. Um, so all those behaviors start acting out in school and stuff like that. 
Well, that, that's exactly what made me think about the youth aid panel and, and, and me just thinking about, okay, you're already a mentor. Are there services that you could provide to the youth aid panels throughout the Philly metro area? I mean, uh, I mean the guy that, that taught me was, was the actual inventor of the youth aid panels up in Bucks County. And he kind of across the country and basically um, spread the word as to how you think panels could work. I mean, you now understand how, how they work. Could you develop a service that would help both parents as well as maybe the, the adolescent that is before this youth aid panel? Um, that would be beneficial. Just a thought out loud for what it's worth it might not be worth anything, but since you're already familiar with these eight panels, uh, that's great. And it sounds like you want to be able to help people that you know maybe just took a wrong turn for whatever reason. Correct. Yeah, you know what? I didn't even think to go there, even though I'm actively um, with the Montgomery County version of it. But I didn't think to go there. And when you, when now that I'm thinking about it and hearing you speak, a lot of the reactions or the decisions that the kids make are because they're acting out for something like um, a loss of a parent or not under not being able to fit in at school or something like that. So that that would be another resource I could use. Thank you for that. Well. Excellent, excellent uh, conversation. So what, one of the, there, there are a couple of, we're talking about product market fit for, for those who, who came in a little later. So, so one of, you know, there are a couple of myths about product market fit. One is that it's easy to attain, right? It's not, it's a process. It really is a process to really understand where you're getting there. There's, again, look it up. There are chronographs that kind of show what that process looks like. You know, two is, is that once you have it, you never lose it. Right? Again, myth, you, 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 the market is going to evolve and there are countless examples of that, right? And three is that once you have product market fit that you no longer have to worry about competition, right? Kind of goes with the, with the one I just said. So, you know, keep that in mind. And, and there's, there's, a, there's an example that I found as I was, as I was preparing for, for this talk. There's a product in the 1930s called Cuddle. K-U-T-O-L, Cuddle. Right, and this was this was a compound used to clean walls that were sullied or, or, or yeah sullied because of coal fire ovens and, and heaters. Right, 1930s common to, to heat your home with coal. Right, and so they had this compound you, you, you cleaned your walls with. You know, 1940s, 1950s, coal heaters went out of style, and oil heaters came in much cleaner. Right, so now what do you do with this product that was the market leader? had tremendous product market fit. People are buying it in droves because that was a big need. Those needs no longer, right? What do you think? Now this product in its current form, in that form exists today, right? And I guarantee you, I know that I have used this product, right? Any guesses with just that basic information? Any guesses what this product could be now? And I will give you a hint. Toothpicks? Not toothpicks, uh, but close. Um, depending, depending, on, depending on on your childhood, was an answer from the from the oh, from you? Uh, I was thinking. Okay. Okay. So so the hint is relatives of the founders of this company, the Cruz Call, started using it with their kids in elementary school, preschool, in arts and crafts. Not gluten. Hmm? What's the answer? I was going to say tempera paint. Tempo, Play-Doh? Play-Doh. Play-Doh. <laughs> Cuddle is now Play-Doh. And, and they, they completely shifted and found a new market to address because product market fit is not everlasting. So that leads into a question. Ask I, away. I, I gotta ask. So uh, your startup with limited resources, mm -hmm. right? Um, you've got a lot of different pivots. It usually happens, right? Nothing, so you said nothing's consistent. It doesn't come in as a bright line. When do you go to lockdown? You can't. You, I mean, you can't. You can't be all over the map. At least as an inviolable product. When, uh, and it, there might not be an answer to this question, but when do you go to lockdown? And um, given that that's the case, uh, do you still pivot based on on reality? Right. I mean, we're talking you pivot it costs money, but on the other hand, right? Uh, if you get it right the first time, it's very very unusual, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, 
What's your opinion on that? Yeah, no, so so it's a great question. And for those you know who didn't hear it, it's 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 at what point do you do you lock in on your idea and say this is the bet that I'm placed? Right. And because you, you can't, you, know, you, you can't continue to iterate, otherwise you have no company. And so again, this is going to be unique in every one of the businesses that we're talking about here from the participants. It's going to be unique to your specific situation. Once you have an idea that you've tested and validated where you've got that product market fit, go, go, right? And because you will fail, right? And from that failure, you'll start to learn what it is that you really need to be doing, right? So you can't just sit there and spin wheels. You've got to make that decision. And it really gets down to, have I done enough to identify the fact that there is a, a problem out there, right? And that my solution addresses that specific problem, not peripherally, but that problem exists and my solution is, is smacked out on top of it, right? And after that, I've got people who are willing to pay me for my solution because it resolves that pain point. Go, right? And then and then let the market tell you whether or not you're right. Other questions? Who have we not heard from today? Asante, sir, tell us about your business. Uh, all right, uh, let's see, is my camera working? Might not be. Uh, let's see. All right, hi, uh, how you guys doing? Uh, my name is Asante, how you do? Um, yeah, my, uh, my business is uh, named Udisa Systems and Technology. And um, we are a kind of metaverse learning tool um, company for teaching and learning about uh, Black heritage. Um, so I kind of got started, uh, you know, with my company, um, you know, originally from uh, Connecticut. Um, so I got started in like 2017, um, about after, uh, after college, when, um, you know, kind of just going through uh, school, uh, private schools in Connecticut, and then, um, you know, PWIs in, um, for college, um, kind of it seemed like there wasn't really um, a lot of context around Black history in schools. Um, I studied Africana studies, but, you know, I've kind of seen roots like 16 times, and like, that's like the only, you know, kind of Black history resource that we really, um, really got. So, um, at, during my junior year, um, I traveled to Ghana um, with a 360 camera and decided to bring some of that content back to, um, you know, to the school just to try and show people what Africa actually looked like as opposed to, you know, kind of seeing the same thing um, over and over again. And kind of from there started to see that there was a lot more interest and a lot more engagement um, from having content like that made available in school. So I started to lean into kind of that XR, um, you know, metaverse type, um, you know, learning environment and decided to apply that towards learning more about um, either Black history or, you know, African cultures um, and started to build a dashboard um, that's, you know, currently on our website. I would say that's our MVP, um, you know, towards letting people see the different countries or, you know, different Black heritage resources um, that are available. Um, since then, we've, you know, decided to branch out a little bit, um, looking at more like XR and metaverse technologies like AR um, for storytelling. So we created a, um, like a folklore series where we take some African folk tales and we like recreate them um, where kids can like use their phones to scan and have like the AR characters come up and, um, you know, kind of see what those um, traditional stories look like in a more modern context. Um, and right now we're in, I'd say, um, still like an MVP, uh, you know, sort of stage. Um, the dashboard, we're trying to build it out more, use better cameras to, you know, take um, more in-depth tours. And then on the AR, um, you know, kind of tip, since we started with, um, you know, like QR codes and things like that in the books, we've recently been developing um, an app, my team and I, um, that we're going to be releasing on Friday. And that's kind of going to be our first like um, app store, you know, kind of push and, um, you know, hoping to participate in like Venture Cafe to kind of see, you know, um, the kind of feedback we might be able to get from those products and um, figure out ways to, you know, go to market 
um, and you know advertise what we have a little bit a little bit better. No, it's fantastic. Um, wow, that's 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 blows me away with, with, with how impressive that is. So without question, so give us a plug for the next session, which is starting in, in 17 minutes, startup roundtable. This is this is where you know startup you know founders can can pitch to an audience of, of varying uh, expertise and and uh, involvement to get really good feedback about where it is that they are and, and, and next steps. So you've got an MVP. Um, what what is what is your next step? Um, so I think right now um, we're trying to again like work on our marketing a bit. Like we've been taking some um, some courses. Like we we downloaded like a founders course on like how to run Facebook ads and things like that better. Um, so we're just trying to, again, try and figure out exactly where, um, you know, our, our users might be and like, you know, get more familiar with them and the experience that they'd be having with the products that we have. Um, because our, uh, I guess like where we've been starting has been, um, you know, not necessarily, um, you know, focused within black communities. You know, that's just kind of like a product of like where, um, you know, I grew up, my team is, um, we have one member from Togo um, and one member from uh, PA also. Um, and, you know, they also had, uh, you know, like kind of private school experiences. Um, but, you know, at Lehigh, we really came together around the fact that like all of our experiences weren't in like our opinion, really um, like substantive of what like black experiences like could be. Um, and we just kind of wanted to build on what that is. Um, so we're really just kind of trying to find different avenues to, you know, get that content out and um, share with more people. Gotcha, gotcha. No, that, that's excellent. So is, is you start to think about, you know, that target market and you think about the questions as, as we've been describing here tonight, which is, you know, again, tell me about, tell me about really eliciting that storytelling from your customer's perspective and understanding how it is that they see the world, right? You've got a solution in your back pocket. You know what you're talking about. You know what you want to offer. How do you get them to tell you that this is the pain point, right? Because once you identify that, then again, you, you, you've got that product market fit. But understand that that's, that's a, a continual process that you have to continue to refine because you will find other, other entrants are going to come in and do similar things or offer different ways of doing it or maybe offer it cheaper. And that's how you start to get that product market fit to your road. Right, but you know, definitely, you know, if you want to, you want to present to Startup Roundtable in the coming weeks, by all means, you know, sign up and we'll make that happen. Uh, Stamatina, you see, you were, you were somewhat active in the chat before. Tell us about your company. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, sorry, my video is not working right now. Uh, bad connection, but so. Uh, I've heard a lot of people speak about being in kind of the education space. Um, I am as well. So my, I'm still in the idea stage and my idea for my organization is focused on environmental slash social education and finding a way to make environmental and climate change knowledge more accessible to schools and hopefully ideally make it mandatory in school curriculums everywhere. Um, my focus right now is bringing this to schools in Greece. I'm Greek American, I'm first generation. So the idea really came to me while I was in Greece and I noticed um, the extent of the trash pollution there and more so people's like, like the culture that allows that kind of behavior and like the way there's no conversation surrounding it um and for a country like Greece that relies heavily on tourism like the problem is only increasing so where I'm at right now is trying to find a way is trying to build my MVP essentially um so this summer I have organized a collaboration with a Greek language school they host an annual summer camp and we're gonna to work together to include environmental education into their camp and their already established program. Um, but I really want to create materials like books and like video content that teachers and even community centers can provide to their students or like members. Um, so yeah, any advice would be really welcomed. 
how do you know that they want books and uh, videos? Well, I was just using that concept as a way to, to like, well, I was thinking about it, like how would you introduce this to schools? What do they already use now? And like, how could those materials be elevated? Like they already use books for lessons, but they're not focused on environmental climate change knowledge. Um, without giving too much away, it wouldn't be necessarily a, like a textbook per se, but more like, like an artistic kind of expression, like an artistic way to explore environmental education in a way that it wouldn't feel like you're reading like a lesson book, but more like a leisurely book. Um, that's just an idea I'm playing with. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm really stuck on like what the MVP would essentially be. Like I have the idea and like the purpose behind it, but don't really know how to present it. Would anyone like to suggest a way to help her find out what that MVP would be? No one? <clears throat> Bruce? Uh go to uh, teachers and ask and say, tell me about your environmental education. Bruce is yes. my new favorite person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna get too much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. for here. <laughs> no, no uh, I ask, and, and, I, and I, I, I asked that question somebody for, for a reason. I, I, wanted, I wanted to lead you to that answer, right? And so you had a solution that, that where a problem may exist. Yes. Right. You don't know that that the delivery of your content through books and videos is most appropriate. Yes. Right? There, could be, there could be there could be any number of reasons why it would be. I'm not saying that it is, mm -hmm. but really it's it's going to your audience and saying, okay, tell me about the last time you, and then you fill in the blanks after that. Have them tell you their story, and from that you'll start to get. You know what? You know the books that we have are fine. It's just that the, the way that the information is delivered is poor. I need a graphic novel. If I had a graphic novel describing this, it would resonate with the kids in a second because they love Marvel, they love kind of a, and, mm -hmm. and so now, and now your MVP in your mind starts to take shape in ways that it didn't before because you have an insight into a, a pain point or a solution that your customer is giving to you, right? And so always start with, tell me about, when you're asking questions of your target market and then you can start to formulate the solutions in your mind yeah thank you that makes sense yeah for sure awesome so so you'll have yeah, to come almost. back next time with 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 a lot of other all of yours tell me about questions because uh, uh john is going to quiz you <laughs> i'll say another place to find where your mvp could be is go out and see what the government's funding um sbir programs kind of my bread and butter um, the Department of Education has SBIR programs. You go to their website, um, and it's grants, it's non diluted money, and they kind of say what they're trying to fund. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a great way to, again, it's, it's all directional, right? It's all directional. And, but, you know, if, if I've got a specific target that I'm looking at, you know, it, you know I need to be speaking to them to understand what they're going to buy, because the government's going to fund a ton of stuff. Uh, and, and this could certainly fall into that category, but you know, what, what's gonna, what, what is the average consumer going to pay for once I'm on the market, right? So it's a combination of funding, finding all those resources and all those pathways to, to define what, what that looks like. Is that helpful? For sure. Thank you so much, you guys. Of course. All right, we are down to our last eight minutes before we get kicked out. Party thoughts? Uh, well, very insightful. You're using the electric car as the MVP because if you look at if you look at if Tesla, I look background. well, yeah. <laughs> if, you look, if you look at Tesla, mm -hmm. right? I mean, first off, Elon Musk didn't start that company. He yeah. took it over, and what he recognized, I mean, their their single product was a two seater, hundred thirty thousand dollar electric car, which is nothing like what they do. They dominate now, but, but not with that at all. It doesn't even exist anymore. It doesn't even make it anymore. But the recognition of the MVP was. You know what people are driving this because it's cool right and they'll go through a lot because it's cool and before that if you look at it there was like the electric leaf and everything nothing really took off right right 
you know, making a $60,000 car that was cool. People will put up with a lot, I mean, lack of infrastructure, whatever. And, and that was the genius there. And then kick in the government because he existed on selling uh, EV credits uh, that the other manufacturers like needed because they needed to, to meet the environmental stuff. So it was a combination of, 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 of the recognition of the MVP to roll it out. And it, it looks like, man, the guy just hit it because he had a vision of, no, I mean, it was all planned. It was all calculated. Same thing with the Steve Jobs example. Mm -hmm. Your examples are great, by the way. It's, yeah, it looks like the guy just invented the, I mean, this is the phone. No, okay. We already knew they had the music player, mm -hmm. right? There was digital cameras. The genius is putting it all together. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, it's, hey, recognize the, the inputs that are out there and then test and throw something out of the market. And, and again, I, I strongly believe test with dollars, yeah. right? Because people will tell you a lot of things, right? right? Um, they pay for it, even if it's not full price, even if this isn't a refined product, you don't have to have it, but something, right? Now, you know, their, their, their opinions are valid, mm -hmm. right? And then the third thing, and I want your opinion on this, because I, I truly believe this is that, look, you've got, you go out to folks, right? You've got zealots, very small, you've got, some people are positive, right? Um, the Airbnb folks said this, and I, and I think this is the case cater your MVP to the zealots, mm -hmm. right? Because if you satisfy them, everyone else will be satisfied and you'll have folks that will, will proliferate, right. as opposed to, hey, I wanna solve everything for everybody. Well, you know, again, startup reality is your limited resources, limited everything. I can't satisfy all that, but if I can get those people who really like my, uh, my solution, and there's a lot of companies out there where I would bet that there are a lot of you know, they'll get a lot of positive feedback mm -hmm. from some people, right? Mm -hmm. Boom, design the product around that. Everything else seems to fall into place. Agreed, yeah. agreed. So, so I'm, I'm a fan of the show Mad Men and, and uh, Don Draper had, had it, one of the most classic lines, I think, right, about, about that exact point. Only sell to believers, right? Don't waste your time selling to someone who's gonna throw up every objection. It's not, it's not worth anyone's time, right? only sell to believers and that, that gets to the point right so if you're a startup and you're, and you're just getting out there find out who's going to evangelize for you find out who's going to be so on your not necessarily mom because you know she's going to buy anything but if they actually believe in your story right that's the person to whom you're going to be selling because they're going to be the ones who are going to support you and then it's going to be that halo effect and the ripple effect beyond that so only sell to believers other questions yeah, Troy. Yep. I was wondering if I could just throw something out to the crowd. It's, it's kind of related to MVP. Yeah. I mentioned the um, the SBIR program. So this is kind of a, a side gig. So uh, the SBIR program is a government program. Um, I think there's 11 different agencies that uh, fund it. And it's pretty much the government giving you money, non dilutive money. They don't take any equity to develop a product specific to what the government's looking for. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing this with a couple of companies, but um, you know, helping them write proposals and helping them find where the government funds it. And there's some really interesting um, solicitations out there. In fact, even the Department of Defense right now has a solicitation to fund small businesses for educational toys for underwater vehicles. We mentioned. Uh, <laughs> So if anybody is interested in the SBIR program, actually I'm putting together a big database of all of the uh, solicitations. What's your, what's your, where, how can they contact you, Sean? Uh, you put my email up there. It's shmacintosh, M-C-I-N-T-O-S-H at Gmail. I can't type, especially when people are looking. <laughs> everyone look away. <laughs> is that um, what, at, at now? S-H-M-C-I-N-T-O-S-H at Gmail. At some point, I'm looking to figure out a way to monetize this, but right now, um, I'm open to just helping people find out where they can get this uh, government funding. Um, so if anybody has, especially tech, um, kind of technology, fit more in with DOD, DOE, um, that kind of thing, but I'm um, more than um, happy to help try to find that fit with Government money and technology. That's a great resource. That's great, especially if you can get non-delivered funding when the government's going to just say, "Hey, here, here you go. Take advantage." 
And I mean, part of the reason I'm doing that is I'm looking for technology to marry with government funds. So yeah. it's not altruistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all right. So, so we've, we've taken a journey, and it was somewhat circuitous, uh, but that, that's kind of how it, my brain works anyway. Uh, like I said, I think it worked without slides. You guys can certainly follow up with my Yelp review if you, if you feel otherwise. Um, but you know, we wanted to take you again from, from where you were last week in, in really solidifying your idea, where some in the group certainly are, to where, where you know, you're going to be next week, which is really talking about financing, you know, get, getting those books in order, make sure that you are prepared. If, if there is you know, additional funding coming in, you know, understand you know, your markets and, and your, your, your MVPs and what that, what that go-to-market strategy is, having product market fit, but before that, getting your problem solution fit. So, so that was a pathway we wanted to take you on tonight. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, it's not you playing John, because he told me what to say. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I appreciate your time, your attention, your comments, your, your questions. You're, you're, you're putting up with my, my incessant banter and calling you out when you didn't want to be called out. Um, thank you, everyone. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John. Nah, Troy, I just want to say thank you. This has been great. Uh, I think uh, everyone's unanimous in this with this is This has been a very good, not only learning session, but a conversation that's been tangible to, you know, to the group. I, I thank you for not using the opportunity <laughs> uh, and, and, and pulling the conversation. And again, thank you very much. No worries. My pleasure. My pleasure.